love kids? Man, they're uh, now what? <laughs> he's, he's, I don't know what. what is, <laughs> man, I, I wish I would have known what I was like when I was that age when my mom was. I, I guess I do remember I was asleep. <laughs> uh, my mom used to call me out at the pulpit. Damn it! I got so. But, I know. <laughs> Oh man. Hey, just be, be before we get into uh, the scripture today. I just want to make a uh, bring something to our uh, just our attention and just a, you know an opportunity for prayer for you. Um, so we are right now looking at on Wednesday nights we had a, a few kids that that weren't uh, in our youth group age, and so you know we are really wanting to be able to uh, have on Wednesday nights uh, then someone that can come and help uh, lead our, our, our young people. And um, so we're, you know, we're in discussion of that and just really trying to, to seek the, the Lord's direction and, and uh, find the person that, that, the, that the Spirit would just uh, equip and lay on your heart, that that be something you would uh, be interested and uh, would like to do. And so we want to make that aware of the church that you guys can be praying about this. It's, uh, you know, it's, I think probably most churches uh, have this uh, uh, problem. It's a good problem, but it, you know, it is, you know, finding uh, people to work with, uh, with the kids. And so, you know, we have uh, our goal, we talked as a board one time, that we want to be holistic in our ministry as a church, which means not only to adults and teens, but also children. In order to be holistic in ministry, we have to have people that are uh, led and equipped that want to uh, take on some of these uh, roles. And so I just want to invite you to be praying with me as we seek uh, the direction as the Spirit would lead. And then empower somebody. Lay on your heart that you want to step into that. And so I just want to make that known and invite you to join me as we pray for that. All right. So we are looking at a, a text today out of the book of James. James, if you want to open there with me. Anyone else smell food? <laughs> you don't? Well, then you better preach if you don't smell the food. No, I'm just kidding. Man, I'm excited to eat this food, guys, aren't you? I hope everyone stays to eat. You know, it's great. Jesus said, and, and uh, I'm, I'm just kind of jumping ahead a little quick because this just kind of popped in my mind. So media people, just uh, bear with me as we roll around with scriptures here. But, uh, but just in John 4, 34, Jesus said, My nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. That's what Jesus is uh, nourishment, you know, his food. One trailer says his food was to complete the will of the Father, to do what he's called him to do. And, and man, that, that's what it's about, to do his will. And that's, what, that's what nourishes and sustains Jesus, is that he would do what the Father would reveal to him in his will. And so this morning, uh, we're going to have uh, the, the spiritual food, and then we're going to jump into the physical food. And so we need both of those, and I'm, I'm thankful that we can share in fellowship uh, through both the Word and a meal together following our service. So I hope everyone will stay and uh, fellowship uh, with one another. James chapter 4. You know, we're, we're almost done with uh, a study that really, uh, this study really sparked my mind as, as we began looking at, we watched this movie called Tomorrowland, really trying to understand how we approach it. And look at tomorrow from today. And, and so all these scriptures that we've been looking at dealt with, uh, in some aspect, our future. And we've been looking at uh, over the last, uh, what, five, uh, what, four or five weeks. And, and, and next week we're going to finish this study with, with one, more, one more thing. But this week's uh, passage, I really hadn't even thought about it um, until last week when I was preaching and we were preaching out of Matthew 6. Jesus talks about, do not worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about what you'll eat or you'll wear. Uh, and, and he goes through this, this picture about not worrying about 
the material things of tomorrow. And, and as I was preaching that is when James, and I have never preached a message over this. I went back through a little sermon notes, didn't have any uh, message on this. And, and, uh, and in the book of James, if, if you study the book of James historically, it, it's kind of like the uh, it's kind of like the cousin no one wanted, uh, because it really when they put the canon together they didn't want book of James in there, because dude James really hits on some things that no one wanted to touch with, and so if you study the history of it there's a lot of good stuff but it really was one of those books that that hit in places people didn't want to get hidden, and and so I didn't really want to preach this but then it was just like the Lord said preach it. And so I said, all right, if you say preach this, then, then we're going to look at this. So James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. If you're able to stand for the reading of the word, I invite you to stand with me as we reverence today. Reading from the NLT, it says, look here, you who say, today or tomorrow we are going to a certain town or we'll stay here or there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? What a, what a profound question. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here for a little while and it's gone. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, you will live and do this or that. Otherwise, you are boasting about your own pretentious plans, and all such boasting is evil. Remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do, and then not do it. Holy Spirit, help us to understand the word this morning. Give us the insight, give us the revelation of what you are speaking to the church in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So what I'm going to do for the purpose of our time together, because there really is a lot I would love to cover in this, and and, and the reality is, is your bellies are probably going to speak louder than I'm going to speak. Uh, I'm going to give you some things. A portion of this I'm going to give you because I want you to go this week and get deeper into it. Is that okay? So I'm not really going to expound a part of this. I'm just going to simply give it to you and then you can go and, and, and really look into this a little bit deeper because there's a lot of stuff here that, that James brings to, to the tension that is, is so good. But the question I want you to just think about this morning is how hard is it for you to trust God with your future plans? How hard is it to trust God with your future plans? We want to really understand because there has been, um, you know, in, in translation and and interpretation of what James is trying to say, there's been uh, kind of this uh, misinterpretation because James really is, you know, I mean, he points this picture, you know, listen up, you who say tomorrow we're going to go do this and we're going to do that. And, and, and James isn't saying there's anything wrong with having plans. And so there's kind of been this other end of the spectrum where, where it's, it's like, basically, you shouldn't do anything. <laughs> you shouldn't make any plans. But even Paul said, make the most of every opportunity. Be wise. In the time that's been given, the book, book of, the book of Proverbs talks about the importance of the time and how you use your time. And so James isn't saying you should just do nothing. But rather, what he's trying to get at in this passage is when you make plans, don't make plans without the Lord. And we're going to kind of unpack this because I really believe uh, it's so important for, for many of us that, that we understand that our future plans, the things that we would like to do, 
I mean, we sit down in, in, in board meetings and we talk about the things we would, we would like to see accomplished. And we talk about the vision of the church and, and outreach and what we want to do. And I don't think there's anything wrong, and I don't think James is saying that's what's wrong. What's wrong is that we're making these plans and we're just going right ahead without ever asking the Lord, is this in fact what we should be doing? Is this in fact the will that you would have? I mean, that's what Jesus said. My nourishment, what sustains me, what keeps me going, is to complete what the Father would have me to do. His work. And so Jesus could know every step he was taking. He was taking because the Father was revealing, here's what I want you to do. And so, do it. But Jesus knew the ultimate plan was to go to the cross. Everything was leading to that. And so what, what, what we're going to look at this morning is really understanding the, the importance of godly decisions and plans in our life. And so we're going to look at, I'm, I'm going to quickly try to go through some scripture with you this morning to help us just capture what the Bible has to say. So the sin... James talks about there is a sin here, there is, there is an evil, and, and simply put, if you want to write this down, the sin in this passage is self-reliance or lack of submission. The sin, for James, what is it, we need to understand, number one, what is it that James is trying to show us that is evil? What do we need to be aware of so that we don't do it? And what he's showing us is that the sin is that we can live in self-reliance and we live in a lack of submission to the will of the Father. And we talked about this last week a little bit in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus said, it's the pagans that chase after these things. It's the unbeliever that chases after these things. Because for the unbeliever, they don't have the appropriate understanding of who God is. And so if we don't have an appropriate understanding of who God is, then everything we do is live in self-reliance. I have to take care of this. I have to see this happen. I have to make sure my future is ready. It does become all about you. Because you don't understand the sovereignty of God. That, in fact, God created everything, but not only did he create everything, but he is involved keeping everything going every day of our life. He didn't just create everything and step back and say, well, there you go, figure it out. No, God is involved, and he's involved with your life and wanting to show you every day where you're going, what you need to be doing. And so one of the things that I, that I really took away from my time of, of studying is, is this. I, I think this is really good, but I hope it's good for you too, that, that we can't claim the promise of God. We can't claim the promise or the protection of God if you plan without it. Does that make sense? I want God's promise, I want God's protection, I want him to bless me. But you can't do that if you plan without him. We can't do something and then say, Lord, I want you to bless me. That's a mindset that fixes a lot of believers today. We just do, and then we're like, Lord, bless me. I don't want to face the consequence of what just happened. <laughs> If you plan without the Lord, you can't ask for the Lord's promise and protection. Because he is going to bless and give peace to his purpose that he puts in your heart. But many believers live the other way. James is telling us, you can't. You can't. He says, how do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? We don't. We don't. None of us do. It's amazing how we can try to think we know what tomorrow is, what's going to happen tomorrow. 
But the reality is we don't. None of us do. We can have guesses and, and we can try to, you know, maybe we, we know tomorrow we'll, we'll go to work and we'll drive this way and we'll have this we'll have to do and we'll eat. I mean, maybe there's general things that we can think of. But the reality is, is we don't know what is going to happen tomorrow. It's kind of like sometimes people ask me, so what is a, uh, as a pastor, what does your schedule look like? And I'm like, I have no idea. Because guess what? I can sit down and make a nice defined plan, but then what happens when that plan gets interrupted by something I didn't plan? That makes sense. All of a sudden, my day's ruined because it didn't go like I thought it was going to. We have to be flexible. That's one of the words that I think we often hate when it comes to planning, to be flexible. We have to leave room that, that when our day is progressing, that, that we have to allow ourselves to be flexible because God may, in fact, intercede. God may interrupt your day with some unplanned event just to see how you'll respond. So, in, in, in every aspect of life, I think there's, there's two spectrum. There's a spectrum and there's two ends of it. So, at one end of the spectrum is a person who throws everything away at the very first sign of something that appears uh, more more promising or urgent. That's one end of the spectrum. They throw everything away. Whenever when anything shows up to be more promising or urgent, we just simply, all right, we're, we're going to move. And then you have the person on the other end who, who, is, who is not distracted, who, who, is, who is so fixed that even if God were to holler at them in the same room, they would never hear it. And so, and so there's a spectrum of, of where we could fall, and I believe where God wants us to be is right in the middle, to, to the point where if he's speaking, okay, I'm, I'm hearing the Father say something, I need to be aware, or I'm not just going to leave something just because it appears more urgent. What really is more urgent, Father? I need to understand. So maybe someone asking you to do something isn't as important as you not doing it. That makes sense. Sometimes we just kind of jump right into something because we feel it's more urgent, and maybe the Father is saying, don't do that. I want you to keep on what you're doing right here. I'll take care of this, or I have someone else that will take care of that. So we have to find out on the spectrum where we need to fall. And I think that's where flexibility comes into the picture. I want to read just a series of scriptures here for you. Listen to Proverbs 16.9. Proverbs 16.9 tells us this. We can make our plans, but the Lord determines the steps. We can make plans, but the Lord determines the steps. Look at Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21. Isaiah 30, 21. You will hear right behind you a voice, and it will say, this is the way you should go, whether to the right or to the left. I love how it says in this translation, right behind you. You'll hear a voice, and this is the way you should go. I think one of the issues that we have as believers is that we become so insensitive to hearing the voice right behind us. I think that's why we make so many plans and we try to figure out what we're going to do because we're not hearing the voice. I once heard someone put it like this, and just bear with it, but we make worship order of service just in case God doesn't show up. We become so insensitive to hearing the voice. We have to make plans 
just in case we don't hear God. Just in case he doesn't show me something. And here's what James is trying to, is trying to tell us, is that even if you don't hear him, wait. Because that may be, in fact, what you need to hear. Is that God is simply saying, I want you to know about my presence more than just knowing about the plan. And so oftentimes, I think we just need to simply get back to an understanding that, that we can have the voice become so dull because we have so many other things speaking the direction. But Isaiah says, there will be a voice right behind you. Do you hear that voice? That's my prayer today. Is that we would all grow in hearing the voice behind us telling us, here's what I want you to do. Short, short story, but just kind of, I mean, I mean, so many examples, but I just want to make this point that that the Holy Spirit has taught me so much over the years in this. And, and, and Tiffany could, can testify and say amen to this, that like when we first met, I, my schedule had to be so rigid. I'm, I'm serious. Like, I didn't want anything, anybody changing my schedule. Like, it was set in stone. And no joke, I would tell God no, because I had to make sure I kept what I, I'm serious. Tiffany could tell you, man, it drove her nuts. I mean, it really did hinder a lot of things, because she'd be like, well, we got my, no, it's not in the schedule. It's not what I'm doing today. I'm serious. And so many things I missed. I, 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 I'm not even going to go into all that, but so many things I missed because I felt like I knew what tomorrow was going to hold more than God did. And James says, that's arrogant. Who knows what tomorrow is going to bring but God? It's evil. Whoa, James, back up now. <laughs> I don't want you to call me out on my bad sin. Like, well, James says it's evil. To make plans without asking first of God, what are you doing? What do you want to do? And then listen, Isaiah 31, listen to the voice that is behind you and speaks. The New Testament gives the testimony of this often in, 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 in various places of I do want to read this one passage, Acts 17, 28. I think it's a, it really is a powerful, powerful reminder for all of our lives. But look at Acts 17, verse 28. Look at that with me, will you just real quick? In him, we, we what? We live. We move, we exist. All right. So three things in Him and in, in, in the Lord. We have existence. Who created and gave you life? He did. In Him we live. And so every day, not only were we put into creation, but, but now we have a, a life that is sustained by his presence, and it says, and we move by in him. I mean, can you really, <laughs> I don't even have words, I wish I did, to, to, to really help us understand the significance of what it means to move in him. I mean, your entire being, who you are, is in him. If you do anything apart from him, you are sinning. Whoa. What? Even if it's good? Yes. We often miss out on chapter 
4, verse 17. It is sin to know what you ought to do when you don't do it. It's not just sin because you do something you shouldn't. It's also sin when you do something you know you should do, you don't do. Wow. All of a sudden, that begins to change because now every day, the things you're supposed to be doing because the Father has led you to it, and when you don't do it because your plan says, I have other things to do, you've sinned. I always wondered why my life seemed so out of order when I lived like that. Well, it made sense then when the Spirit revealed to me when you're living by your own life and agenda, when you're supposed to live, exist, and move in need. Wow. But we still continue to live like what James points to us in this chapter. Though. We still try to live and plan by our own pretentious plans. We should plan. We should evaluate uh, current situations. We should evaluate what's going on in our life. That's not the problem here for James. The problem is, is that we do all this planning, but we don't have the acknowledgement of God's sovereignty and authority to determine the future of our lives. We try to create our own future. I've never heard people say that phrase before. You need to create your own future. And I think there's good intentions in that. I think someone told me that once. You need to create your you get to create your own future. And I'm just thinking, I sure hope I don't. <laughs> because sure, it, I, I I might have a wonderful picture in my mind of what my future can look like, but but the reality is, it is a good thing to be ignorant of your future. And that's what James is showing us. It's good to trust. Because, because trusting, trusting is believing your future will happen in the love of God. Trusting by faith is believing that your future will happen in the love of God. He knows. He's good. And I'm going to leave it to him. We can be smart and be wise, understand what's going on. And when we begin to talk about what we would like to see, we begin to say, what does James says? We should say, though, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do and go down. If the Lord wants us to. We, we, we kind of have this close, this, uh, we often say, you know, it, you know, we always talk about, you know, it's the Lord's will. If it's the Lord's will, you know, people used to use that phrase all the time, if it's the Lord's will, and we kind of like, ah, quit using that, like, just stop saying that. I think that's where it became a problem, then, because all of a sudden we're like, we shouldn't say it, it's the Lord's will. It's too clicky, it's, it's too cliche. But James says that's not how we should speak, though. If the Lord wills. If, if, if the Lord wills that we'll do this, or if the Lord wills, the Lord wants me to do this, then I'll do that. And so I'm, I'm preparing and I'm, I'm planning. I'm evaluating, I'm assessing. Because every minute of the step that I'm taking, I'm having to assess what is it, what is it the Spirit's leading me. Okay, I'm hearing this, and okay, I'm evaluating, I'm assessing, I'm talking. And that's how Jesus lived his life. You just simply assessed and evaluated. Father, okay, okay, we have this going on. Okay, what's next? And that's how Jesus lived. And he's our model. Don't go to somebody and ask them, you know, I want you to pray over me so I can understand my calling in life, what I'm supposed to do. No, I'm going to pray over you that you'll learn to trust the Father. Because you need to learn to trust God before I pray over you what... What's my calling? What's God going to do in my life? No. You need to learn how to trust God. Because when you trust God, you release everything to Him. And then He will show you, moment by moment by moment, 
what your life should look like and what you should do. And so in the New Testament, just write these down. I'm not going to read through these, but just think about all these accounts. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. And, uh, Acts 19, 21. Uh, Acts 18, 21. 1 Corinthians 4, 19. All these, all these New Testament passages is, is, is the reference to understanding that uh, but when Paul would speak, he would speak his language in a way that said, if God wills, if God opens, if God leads, everything was about if God leads, if he's doing it. Because I don't want to push a door open that I shouldn't push open. Trusting. Putting everything into his hands. Think about this. Genesis chapter 11. Do you remember this? So, so Genesis chapter 9 verse 1 talks about how God wanted to uh, use after the flood uh, the life of, uh, of Noah and, and to spread and, and to fill the earth. And then for the next chapter, in a, a chapter 10, uh, there's a bunch of names that are given of, uh, of people. But in chapter 11 it says, and so the people that were on the earth decided that they wanted to build a tower. Remember, this is the Tower of Babel, because it was at that point that they were like, okay, we all speak the same language, we, you know, and so let's build a tower where we can all just stay together. And, and, and it says that this was their plan. And then it says, and then God, I'm like, whoa, it's, it's pretty bad. It says, and then God spoke. They didn't even talk to God yet, but they were already planning. And it says that God threw them into confusion. And they began to speak and they were scattered. If you ever wonder why things aren't clear in your life, if you ever wonder why things are confused, it may be because you are building and planning apart from Him. And so God threw the people into confusion. Let me show you another passage. Uh, open up to, to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. So, so Jesus talks about the parable of the rich fool. And this is what James is saying. It is foolish. It is foolish to try to say, we're going to do this tomorrow, we're going to go here, we're going to make this much, we're going to sell here. James is saying it's foolish. And that's what Jesus talks about in Luke chapter 12. There was a rich man who had so much, and so... It says, a rich man had fertile farm that produced fine crops. This is verse 16. And he said to himself, listen to this. He said to himself, what should I do? Underline that. What should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. And then he said, I know. You know, it's pretty bad when you, when you ask the question, what should I do? And then you answer it yourself. Oh, I know what I should do. Hello, fool. <laughs> oh, I know what I should do. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I know more than the God of the universe knows. <sighs> all right. So Jesus says, he said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear all my barns down, and I'll just build bigger ones, and I'll put everything inside. I'll have more than enough room. And then he said, and then I'll sit back and I'll say to myself, here it is. Friend, you have enough sort of way. Now you can just take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. And then verse 20. But then God said. Man, every time I read that phrase, but then God said, it just like gives me chills. Because we are consulting our lives we're consulting the present success and the future security based on what is good for me. Hmm. Wow, you don't even know what tomorrow holds, and yet you think you know what's best for the security of your future. And you don't even know what tomorrow holds. And God looks out and goes, huh, do you now? So that's what you want to do. And so he says, well, guess what? Tonight your life is going to be taken from you. Now he's going to take all that you stored up in these barns. Wow. I'm so glad I don't know what my future details are. Sure, I 
we talk about our future and we talk about our, our kids and what our hopes and dreams are for them and what we hope to see happen. Nothing wrong with that, but we do it in a sense, Lord, well, we want to know. Well. We want to know what we want to do. We want to know what's the best, perfect, pleasing will of God is. I don't want to pretend like I got this all together and know everything that is in the future. And so here's an important, I think, takeaway, important lesson, if you just want to write this down, is that it matters greatly to God how we think about our future plans as much as it does the actual pursuit of them. It matters to God how you think about your future just as much as the actual pursuit of it. Because your thinking forms everything of your actions. And so if there's blessing that comes with the peace that comes because of God's purpose, then James shows us just three practical things, consequences that come when we leave God out of our planning. Number one, when you leave God out of your planning, it leaves you unprepared. Because He knows your future, you don't. If you go, go forth without Him, you're going forth unprepared. It leads to overconfidence. We just looked at that in the story of Luke 12, and then you will miss his plan for you. You can miss his plan for your life when you plan without him. The best place to live, and maybe you agree with me, is in the pursuit of God's purpose. And then I don't have to worry about tomorrow. Because I'm staying in step. He's preparing me for what he's prepared for me. Every step he's preparing me. He's showing me. He's teaching me. For what he's already prepared in my future. And so I pray that all of us this morning will just understand that significance. Excuse you, buddy. I'm going to invite the worship team as we as we close in understanding his name and the, the power of his name in our life to show us and reveal to us the things that are forthcoming. I want you to listen to Psalm 37.4. And I was laying in bed last night and I couldn't fall asleep and I was thinking about today and just going through some of my mental notes and processing things and one of the scriptures that just kept coming to me was Psalm 37.4. It simply says, take the light in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. You've probably heard this before. And I often, and I, and I used to think, you know, this just meant if I delight myself in him, he's going to give me everything I want. And then last night, the Holy Spirit began to Reveal it and show me some things about this, this, this verse. If you delight yourself in the Lord, it says it will give you the desires of your heart. And I began to realize that the desire is closely connected to the delight. If I am delighting in the Lord, and he's going to give me the desire of my heart, and so it's in the heart that when I'm delighting in God, that begins to shift the desire of my heart. 
because for many people, they just read that and say, well, if, if that's my greatest desire, the Lord's going to give it to me because I love him. Maybe that's true. Maybe he will. But if we delight in the Lord, then that means the heart is going to be changed and everything is going to be focused on him. Which means what I delight in is my desire. My desire is how that my delight is everything that the Lord wants for me. Which means my desires have to what? Change. It's not easy. But the more you delight in the Lord, the more that just begins to... Like we're getting ready to delight in some wonderful food, right? Amen. Amen. So the more that we delight in the Lord, the more the spiritual aroma of His heart meets us. And we begin to feel what the Father wants. It begins to resonate and it becomes the strongest thing about our heart. So we have to delight ourselves this morning in the Lord. And that's just how, how, how I want to pray before we sing this song. That He will change everything we want until He is all we want. Holy Spirit, we in a sense need you this morning to change our spiritual taste buds. To taste and to delight in something that is in you. We delight in you. We have to turn and focus upon you. Our, our taste buds have to adjust. They have to learn to adapt towards you and not ourselves. We take the light in you this morning until everything that we want is you. When our greatest desire of our heart is you and when that becomes the reality, then we understand that you want to give us the desire of our heart because we have lined up with you. And that's how we want to live our future. That's how we want to live tomorrow. That's how we want to plan and, and look to what's to come. We want your will. We want to know what, what you're up to and, and how, how you're directing our life. And so I just pray for each of us this morning that, that for each person that is here that, that they will take a minute just to, to really look inside and ask, is James talking about me? To the person who says today or tomorrow we'll, we'll go and do this. Is the attitude of our heart really doing things that is leaving you out of it because we feel that we have to do this. Then we need to come to a point where we become sensitive to the voice behind us. We need to know the Father's voice that wants to lead us, that wants to direct every aspect of our life because you are good in your love. And so, Spirit, we need you this morning to Show us in our heart what is our greatest desire. Is it us or is it you? We want to glorify you in every part of our life and trust you for the future of it. Just invite you this morning. Let's stand as we uh, close this song.